It's a brand new day. Let's teach your way. It's time for music play. Welcome back to the Music Play Minutes podcast. This episode is also available as a webinar with a handout and a PD certificate. All extra resources, including visual examples mentioned in this episode, can be found at workshops.musicplay.ca. Today, we had the pleasure of hosting Sonia Patel. In this episode, Sonia will be discussing what do you know about blindness or visual impairment? Types of visual impairments. Enabling success in the music room. Modifications and adaptations. Technology. Music play demo and resources. Hi, everybody. I am Denise Gagne, and I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce you to my friend, Sonia Patel. Sonia and I go back a long ways to some of my early publications when she would email me for t- copies of the text so that she could braille them and read them. And that was the first time I realized I'm communicating with a teacher who is a full-time teacher who is blind, and it has astounded me ever since. So, um, Her official biography reads, this is her 24th year teaching K-5 general music at Byers Dowdy Elementary in Lebanon, Tennessee. She has a bachelor's of music education from Middle Tennessee State University and a master's in special ed with an emphasis in teaching children with visual impairment from Vanderbilt University as well as level one or certification. She enjoys spending time with her family and helping leading music at her local temple. Um, I want to share a video and I am told I can share my screen and share this video to show you what Sonia looks like in her classroom with kids. I thought Sonia would have an aide in full time with her, but she only has an assistant in with her six hours a week. And this is her little guys. They sound adorable. And I'm going to turn us over to Sonia, who is the best possible resource. Um, I think Sonia is doing this webinar, so I stopped sending her people's emails to communicate about um, uh, about accommodations for the students that are visually impaired or blind. And we're so grateful to you, Sonia, for giving us this webinar and your time, because I know you've got a lot of wonderful information to share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Um, Thanks for that grand introduction. Um, I hope that I can help some people with this and, and uh, please feel free to email me with any more, uh, any other questions that you might have uh, after this webinar as well, or as things are happening. Okay. So we are going to talk today about music room accommodations uh, for students who are blind or visually impaired. And funny enough, I myself, before I was trying to do this webinar, I was trying to do some research to see what exactly was out there. You know, I have lived this uh, all of my life, being blind myself uh, since birth. I have lived this being blind, and that's just a part of my world. So uh, that's just what I do. You know, I, I teach just as you teach. And I thought to myself, hey, I wonder what information is out there to help music teachers. Um, to, and, and to help me put together my presentation in case I was trying, you know, forgetting something. So I looked and unfortunately there, there's very, um, not a lot of stuff out there that talks about uh, elementary music in particular. Um, I did find a couple of things that I have uh, put in our resource section, but uh, that you can, you can view afterwards, but there's not a lot out there. So today we're going to talk about, um, what you know about blindness or visual impairment. We're going to talk about those things in just a second. Uh, We're going to talk about types of visual impairment, things that you can do to help your students be successful in your music class, modifications and adaptations. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to do a, I'm going to do a, a demo of the accessibility that Music Play has done on their website, super accessibility. And I also have some resources to share with you. Now, let's start off today by a little poll, with a little poll. It's a true or false little poll. So our first question, Denise, uh, already knows this answer, but most <laughs> people use a, uh, most blind people use a guide dog. The answer, let's see, what's what kind of results did we get? I, my, Lynn? 
My answer is false. And ninety six percent of the people said false. So only four percent said true. That is correct. Correct. Uh, most people do not use a guide dog. Uh, false is the correct answer. And um, me personally, I'm dog phobic. So uh, I have all the compassion in the world for them and, you know, think that they are fabulous and marvelous for what they do for others, but they are not my choice. Um, we didn't include this question, but I just wanted to let you know that Uh, Guide dogs do not take the blind person wherever they want to go. The person that is the blind person is in charge and they must know where they're going to go. The guide dog is not magical. I know that's hard to imagine, but it is not (laughs) magical. They are very smart, though. Sometimes they get trained to go a certain route. And if you go uh, walk that route, you know, over and over, then, yes, they kind of have an idea. You know, they know where they where uh, they're supposed to go. But the next question, blind people hear better. Denise, what do you think? I think false. And what's our percentages? 53% said true and 47% said false. So I'm going against the um, popular opinion. Well, that's great because you would be correct. And she has not seen these questions. (laughs) I will tell you, she has not seen these questions. I don't think. Well, she might have glanced at them, but. I, I, I may have, but okay. But she <laughs> doesn't know the reading. answers. She does not know the, the answers, but the no. answer is false. Everybody thinks that, that blind people hear better. And my kids at school think that I, I tell them, I'll say, you know, boys and girls, you know, I don't, my eyes don't work, but my ears. And they'll all say, uh, I said, but what do I do with my ears? And they'll say, you can hear really, really good, better than anybody in the whole entire school. And I say, that's probably true. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, blind people do not hear better, but they, they, uh, we use our sense of hearing more so than, um, than you would you're because you're depending on your eyes so much, but we actually have the same amount of hearing. Next question, uh, blind people more likely to, to be musical. What's our poll result? And I- 41 true, 41% true, 59% false, mm-hmm. and I'm going with the false. Yeah, that is that is correct. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it is kind of funny that way that there are so many blind people who are musical. Um, Stevie Wonder, I believe, is on this slide, I think, I and Ray Charles and all those wonderful people. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about that. But I think maybe they develop their hearing. Because could, they, could they be. compensate. Could be. Yeah. And well, you know, but I have heard some blind people who can do not have a sense of pitch. Just saying. Uh, you should <laughs> be course. careful not to say, do you see what I mean? Or did you watch that show? So this is really close. True is 51%. False is 49%. And I don't know. I'm thinking True. I don't want to offend anybody. Well, that's what everybody thinks, but the answer is false. Um, There is no offending, really. You know, it's just the way we speak. And uh, it really sounds strange to say, do you hear what I mean? Or did you hear that show last night? That's just not the way we speak. And, I mean, I did watch it in my own way, you know. So um, I am getting some mental imagery through it. Or do you see what I mean? That's just what we say, you know. It just sounds kind of strange to say, do you hear what I mean? Or, you know, something to that effect. So that is false. Uh, All blind people can read Braille. So Paul said 4% true, only 4, and 96% said false. And I'm going to go with the false. That is correct. Unfortunately, which it makes me very, very sad as an educator and as a you know, just a human, um, fewer than 10% of blind people read Braille. And it, I, I could not, I tried to look for an exact number, but unfortunately I could not find one. Um, uh, you know, to me, it is illiteracy. If you cannot, if a child cannot read Braille. Um, I, I do understand that there are many forms of reading, I guess, audio, audio being one of them now, but there is nothing that compensates in my mind, um, you know, you, uh, 
reading letters, you know, reading words um, and experiencing as, as you would. So um, that's a very sad situation, but that's where we are, unfortunately. Do you, do you think that's because of the, the do you think it's because of the difficulty of reading Braille or is it perhaps because there's not enough teachers qualified to teach it? Well, you know, teacher shortage is definitely a problem, uh, is definitely an issue. Um, and I don't think it's because of the difficulty. Now, I will say that uh, there are a lot of other disabilities that are associated with blindness nowadays. I don't think it's because of the difficulty of it. I think it's more to do with the teacher shortage or the fact that teachers are not trained. I mean, they're not trained effectively or, or they don't train themselves even after having a class uh, on, on reading Braille proficiently. Therefore, they can't teach it as proficiently. That's just my opinion, um, but that's how I feel. So blind people see uh, blind people see nothing or at least very little. Okay, I lost the poll. So Carrie Lynn, you're going to have to give the answers. Yeah. So the true. This is another one that's pretty tight. True is at forty seven percent, and false is at fifty three percent. Wow. So blind people see nothing or very little. That's that's. I would say that's true. Um, in that. If we're talking about blind people, they some of them see, might see shadows, might see uh, light, but uh, or some of them might not see anything at all. So I would say that that was true. That was kind of a tricky question. And I had to ask myself whether it was true or false a couple of times, just the way it was worded. But um, the next one, glasses are worn or used by most blind or visually impaired people. And for this one, we have 14% believe it's true and 86% believe it's false. I, I was going to give my, my guess because I think that if it, we're talking visually impaired, I would say mm -hmm. yes, most would right. use glasses. That, that is correct. That is correct. Um, the trick part was the blind part and... Um, I guess, but, but yes, glasses are worn by most visually impaired people, but not always. So, but I would say true for that one. All right. Uh, blind people learn their way around by counting steps. Yeah. So this one's another tight, true, 53%, false, 47%. The answer is definitely false. Um, I got to think about where I'm going, much less worry about how many steps I've taken to get somewhere. I might lose count after 127, you know. Um, so we definitely, there is no mm -hmm. step counting going on here. Uh, it's, it's traveling is done more through landmarks, um, uh, distance estimation, what's called distance estimation. So I know that I've walked approximately this distance, uh, but it, but it definitely no step counting involved there. So, but most people think so. So that's very interesting. All right. Uh, you have to know Braille in order to teach a blind student. And I think, I, mean, I think we gave away the, the answer to this one when did. you said only 10% of people know Braille. That's so right. I'm going to say no. But oh. the question is, you have to know Braille in order to teach a blind student. And that is false. And what was our percentage on that? 94% believed it was false. Excellent. Excellent. We as music teachers you don't know much Braille and you're teaching blind students. Teaching blind and visually impaired students will take lots of extra time helping him or her to their room, getting back down the hall to the next class. So we've got 16% believe it's true and 84% believe it's false. And, and I would go with the false because absolutely, I think it. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yes, there will be some help that's needed. Um, but the end result that we want to strive for is to have independent students and people. So great job on that poll. That's kind of fun. Um, thanks, Gary Lynn, for figuring that out. So uh, now we're going to get into the meat of this. Um, let's talk about some types of visual impairment. So there's blindness. Uh, and like I, we talked about uh, blind, some blind people have light perception so they can see light, light. Uh, I cannot, I do not have any light perception. 
Sometimes they have object perception, which means they can see that there's some object in front of them, but they couldn't tell you what it was. Okay, they, they can't look at somebody's face. They can't tell you who that person might be, but they might know that there's a face there or an object of some sort. Then there we ha have our low vision population, and those are the people that we see most, uh, more so. Um, it's a greater population with... Uh, as, especially as people get older. So for with people who have low vision, they see less than the normally sighted person sees and that vision cannot be corrected by much. Uh, so the perception is, is uh, there's a certain number that has to be met and um, that's not so, so important to us right now, but just know that that is the case with low vision students. So how can I help my students to be successful in the music room? Your number one friend, I like to say that they're your best friend, is your TVI or teacher of the visually impaired. Most school systems hopefully will have someone. Um, like I said, there is a shortage, but every school system is supposed to have someone in your school system that, that has that qualification. And um, that is the person you need to go to for advice. Now, when it comes to music, that's a different story, but We'll talk about that in a minute. But in terms of accommodations for that particular student, that is your best friend. Um, sometimes you might have in your state, you might have a school for the blind that has an outreach program, and uh, they may be willing to help you as well if you do not have a, a teacher of the visually impaired. Let's talk a little bit about Braille music. This is kind of a hot topic, uh, but I this is my feeling. Um, don't expect that Braille ha music has to be taught to a student who is blind. I will tell you that I did attend the school, Tennessee School for the Blind, and I learned Braille music when I was in the third grade. I'm so grateful to have that skill, but I was in a place where Braille music could be taught to me, and I could, I, you know, every day if that needed to be the case, or I, I, I forgot how much I did work on it, but it was not once a week for 10 minutes. The fact of the matter is Braille music is like another language or code within itself. During the early elementary years, the student is trying to figure out how to read Braille, how to read what we call literary Braille, which is letters and, and um, numbers and such. The other thing is TVIs, very few of them are trained, are not trained to know Braille music or to read Braille music or to teach Braille music. Uh, some do. I, I know some that have taken upon themselves to to teach students, but that's later on. Usually uh, it, it could be an option. People ask me all the time. You know, they'll say I, I'm interested in this student learning Braille music. I want them to learn it along with the other students. But that's just hard to do. Um, now, if you feel that the student is very serious about music in, in later years, then uh, that's something that I would have that conversation with your TVI about. Don't put it up upon yourself to do that. It's not your responsibility uh, to learn Braille music. So here we have a chart of Braille music. And when I talk to you about the different language aspect or different code, um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Like the person, I should say, that invented Braille music himself, Louis Braille, he is the person who invented Braille as a 15-year-old student. Um, he was a, an organist and a very accomplished organist, and he um, came up with the Braille music code, and it is still pretty much intact. There's There's been some, I, I think, uh, some revisions to it, but it's pretty much intact as to what his original code was. So for example, the letter D in Braille equals an eighth note C. If you add a dot to the bottom of it, then it becomes a quarter note on one side. If you add two dots on the bottom of the what we call Braille cell, then it becomes a whole note. Or So, so there is no staff equivalent at all for Braille music. It is not written on a staff. It is written linearly. Um, so there, there you have an idea of kind of a little bit about uh, bra Braille music and what it looks like. Uh, all I did to find it was Google it, and there it was. It, I do feel that it is important skill 
um, if, if that's something that a student wants to pursue later on, for sure. There are many, many people who do read mu- music, Braille music, very well um, and uh, are very accomplished musicians. Uh, low vision aids. Uh, so these are things, devices, such as this, some of the things you he- see here. We have some uh, magnifiers. We have some telescopes. Sometimes people use colored lenses um, that are better for to help them for light sensitivity. Um, they kind of look like uh, safety glasses and um, they're different colors. So these are things that can help them. Um, sometimes students use what are called slant boards and they're, it's, it's a board basically that, that the paper is um, put, you can hold the paper, the kid can hold the, the paper at a certain angle so the child doesn't have to get so close to it depending on their, on their vision. So safety first. Um, it's so important for everybody, of course, to make sure that your music room is a safe place. And, you know, we have so many things in our music rooms. Um, I, myself, when I'm setting up my music room, I have to be very intentional that things are put in a certain way. And my room pretty much stays the same most of the time. I mean, I don't do a lot of moving of furniture because it's not fun to trip over a xylophone. In my sub plans, I will say, please do not move any furniture. And if you do, please put it back where you found it. You know, finding furniture in in the wrong place is not is not very fun. Um, I would talk once again to the to the uh, teacher of the visually impaired, the TVI, about lighting conditions for a student who who has low vision, as well as talk to them about contrast. It is so important, like we talked earlier, to to allow independence for our students. It's fine to ask a student if they need help, but ask. Don't assume that they need help. To lead a student who's blind, just ask them, can I, would, would you like an arm? And usually they will take your elbow. They do not take your hand. Children that are little, like I would say kindergarten or preschool age, might take your wrist. If you're standing beside them, they might take your wrist just because they're shorter people. And uh, this technique is called sighted guide. And there's a whole technique that is done to, to help lead a person that your TVI also can can help you learn. Some people use their cane to travel students in the younger age. Sometimes, you know, when they're young, they they learn to use their cane and sometimes they may bring one to their classroom, encourage them to use it. But it depends once again on the situation and what's happening in the classroom. Uh, Students can follow you who are visually impaired. They can follow you just fine usually, but Uh, When you have a question, just ask the child what he or she needs. Don't assume. So this is one of my favorite parts is about modifications and adaptations and seating. You know, uh, I have a grid. I wish I had taken a picture of some of the things in my classroom, but I have a grid uh, carpet on my carpet. It's taped off. Um, I've just taken duct, duct tape and taped squares on my carpet and have numbers on my carpet where my students sit and I will ask teachers to place them in their seats and sometimes I do that for discipline issues my number three spot is a special spot for my friends it's directly in front of me and those are my kids that I need to keep my eye on well for our visually impaired students it is important for them to sit front and center in a, in a place where they can see. And it's also important to think about the glare in your classroom, the glare, the lighting um, for your students with low vision. It may be beneficial to you to have your student who is blind be close to you as well so you can help them. Uh, when it comes to teaching movement, you can partner them with a peer. You can use what's called hand over hand. So you're actually showing them what to do with your hands Sometimes I like to stand, if I'm trying to learn movement, I like to stand behind the person and feel their hands and, and see what, how they're moving. Uh, windshield wipers, that's a classic example. Windshield wipers, when I was in college, they said, you know, when you're doing steady beat, windshield wipers. Well, I don't really know what that looks like. 
So I would stand behind the person and feel their hands, and then I can copy those hands. So some of the things that movements that that uh, you might take for granted, child who has blindness has never seen before. They don't know what that looks like. It's important to give clear verbal directions. And that's going to help all of your students. Manipulatives. We, uh, I'm sure all use popsicle sticks. There's wonderful things called wiki sticks, uh, which are, you can, they're like wax sticks and you can bend them into whatever shape you need to bend them. Pipe cleaners are good. Uh, any kind of tactile represent, representation of, of uh, concepts that you might be teaching high and low. Magnetic music notes. I have a, in the resources, I have a great place that you can find those. You want to make sure that the note, even though the child, you know, you might not be teaching much about the staff, but but you might a little bit just remember the child is learning Braille. So the staff is not their main means of reading the child who's blind. It's not their main means of reading, but you want to expose them to, to what that looks like. Uh, but don't expect them to that's going to be their way of reading music. You could do Q for quarter, have the TVI braille that out, Q for quarter or EE for eighth, eighth. Uh, sometimes I will do that. Um, so those are letters that they know, but you can also show them using those, those, those uh, music notes, that, which are the shape of the notes themselves. Um, contrasting colors, black on white works for most, but not all students with low vision. And once again, ask your TVI about that. Choir, uh, provide lyrics or recorded parts for songs. Uh, currently, right now, I'm, I am using what's called a Braille display. And it is a uh, device. I'll have to show it a little bit when, I'm, when I am not sharing screen. Uh, where I have the Braille that I'm reading to you, the slides. I have my slides in Braille so I can read what's on the slides right now. And so you could do the same thing. You can provide the lyrics as a Word document or whatever document um, and email it to your TVI and they will get it in a format for your student. Instrument modifications, uh, barred instruments. Um, you could label with Braille or you can use other tactile materials. Remember that when they're in kindergarten, they're learning to read along with their peers. They're learning Braille along with their peers. So in the beginning, it's it's easy for you too to have perhaps different tactile materials for your bars. And you might want something on specific bars if you don't want them to use all their bars. Of course, you know, we can take our bars off. We talked about hand over hand. Make sure you show them that with their mallets how to hold them, just as we do in ORF, practice first with your fingers. That's that's uh, just a standard procedure that we've done, right? Recorder, rote teaching is good. Uh, hand over hand once again. And uh, when I was in ORF level one, many, many years ago, we used uh, the little hole reinforcers on our arm at the time to, so you could kind of feel how to cover those holes on the recorder. I, I um, I still remember that, that feeling of those holes and how that kind of helps, you know, initially would help a student to, to have a feeling of where their hands are going to go. Ukulele is new for me. Uh, I just started teaching ukulele myself with my kids last year, and I'm still kind of working out the modifications for myself. But I think that in the beginning, for myself, I put something tactile on the sides of the ukulele where the fingers go um, between the frets. I put just something, just uh, it could be uh, your TVI can help you with this as well. There are so many materials out there that they have access to. Don't try to come up with something. Ask that person. There are many things that are sold for labeling. Doing this will help, of course, with orientation of those fingers. Most importantly, I would say follow your instinct. Um, don't try to overcompensate because there is a fine line between the two. So technology, you know, that is the, the age in which we are living in right now. And I'm so thankful to, to have technology. I could not do my job without it. And uh, I could not read 
you know, books and notes and things without it, audibly and both in Braille. But, uh, you know, just being able to, Denise, many years ago, 1999, when I got my job, my, my first job, well, my the job that I currently am at, that I've been there for 24 years. But when I got that job, I did not have a lot of resources available to me. And when she emailed me, I thought, let me just ask. And so she emailed me the text of one of her publications, and I was able to load it onto my Braille device and read it along with everybody else, because a lot of teacher materials aren't available. So to do that, I use what's called a screen reader. And uh, sometimes I do connect it to a Braille display as well. But the screen reader is a piece of software that speaks whatever is on the screen. Things have to be accessible for that to happen. We'll talk about that in a minute. But just, just because it speaks doesn't mean that it's accessible. Do know that. Most of our music programs are definitely not accessible because they're so graphical in nature. Music notes do not read very well unless there's some accessibility that has been done to make that happen. Uh, there, We're going to talk about a couple of different types of screen readers and how to start them. Windows has what's called Windows Narrator. And this is something that's built into Windows. You can enable it on any computer. It is not very, very robust, but it could help you when you're working with a student. I will talk about that when we do our website demo in a minute. JAWS for Windows is a, is a uh, piece of uh, wonderful software that I use, have used for many, many years. Uh, it is very robust, as I call it. It does so much. And uh, most of the time is purchased for students here in the United States. Um, there are other screen readers out there as well. Uh, I didn't include ev everything, but there is one called NVDA. I didn't write that on here, but that's another screen reader which can be used. Um, once again, consult your TVI. Chromevox. There's the shortcut key. Control-Alt-Z is the shortcut key for that. It is on the Chromebook. I have a Chromebook at work. And if I get in a real pinch, that's when I use my Chromebook with Chromevox. If something has is just not working, that's what I will use. I know I can. It is kind of difficult, I feel like, to maneuver. But if a child is trained on it, then that may, they may, that may be what they use. And, hey, it's out there. So kudos to Google. VoiceOver for Mac, and uh, VoiceOver is the screen reader. It is in the Apple family. Any iPhone, any Mac, any iPad has what's called VoiceOver, and it is what I use on my iPhone. Uh, I do not have a Mac, but I have used a Mac before, and it is fabulous to, to be able to use something that is a touchscreen device and uh, you know, use it just as you would because of the work that they have done. Now, when we talk about low vision students, we talk about screen magnification software. So this makes the so what's on the screen enlarges the font. And that's different than just blowing something up, making the font large in Word. That's different from that. And uh, so, so this is, uh, the, it is built into Windows, Mac, and uh, Google products as well screen magnification software. It is also available from other uh, third-party software. Uh, the same people that do uh, JAWS for Windows, they also have screen enlargement software. It's called something that I'm not remembering right now. That is another option. So before we continue, um, do we have any questions right now that I can answer? Yes, we have one question. Um, how um, have you taught Braille music to any students in your career? I have not. I have not. Um, that would be something that the TVI would be responsible for doing. And because I'm worried about teaching music, if you know right. what I mean. Right. Yep. I don't think I've ever had a blind student, actually. I've had low vision students, but I've not had any blind students hmm. so far. Okay. Okay. We have two other questions. Oh, they're actually just coming on in. So um, do you find yourself teaching more music by ear rather than reading music in your classroom? Um, yes. And no, I, I, I feel like I don't cover the staff as much because it's harder for me 
I mean, I can teach it. I have a magnetic staff and I can teach it, but I feel like I'm not as effective, I guess. But I, I mean, I do teach them those concepts. My kids are excellent rhythm readers uh, because I have my rhythm cards brailled because I read the braille music. So, I mean, I braille my cards. I have an assistant, like Denise said, six hours a week, and I braille my cards, my rhythm cards, and I can teach rhythm just fine. But when it comes to the staff notation, it's a little more difficult for me, but I mean, I can do it, but I, I just don't feel like I'm as effective because I can't exactly point to things on the screen or um, show them exactly. But now I do have in my classroom a set of staff boards that we created with, uh, we, we took a magnetic dry erase board and then we bought the magnetic notes that I've given you a resource for. And we put the staff on there like so I could feel it carved it into the board, actually kind of cut it, scored it into the board because we found that you could use pinstripe tape for the lines, but then the kids would pull it off and stuff. You know, I could teach it and then I can, they can show me their work, but it's, it's just a little more cumbersome. All righty. That's good to know. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for starting a student in band? I think uh, just having an open conversation with the band director and the the uh, TVI and them working together. Oh, many, many students are in band. I myself was in the marching band. And when I went to uh, high school for a little while, I went to public high school and, and I was in the pit, uh, as they call it. But I uh, know many students who have joined band and it works, you know, it works for them. Uh, once again, you know, providing those, um, it may be done more by ear. And that's when Braille music does come into play, I think, because by the time they, they have an interest in music. Okay, so now you get to hear my wonderful uh, screen. Music room accommodations for students who are blind or visually impaired. PPTX dash power. And I'm going to meet webinar demo vertical bar music play online. I'm going to slow her down. Slower, slower, slow, slower. All right. And two, high or low, one. I have created a list of a couple of things I want to show. So I do want to talk about the resources. So two, we're going to go to one of the games here. This is the high or low game. Are we good, Miss uh, Carrie Lynn, on screen share? Yep. I can see okay. you and I can hear you. And it is. All right. Fabulous. Good All right. So I'm logged in right now as a student. Now, I do want to say to you that Music Play is one of the only sites that I know of that have taken the time to make their website accessible. And it is such a thrill. And I could go on and on and I already did yesterday when we had our test run and let them know how wonderful it is. But I'm just telling you that this these skills that we're using are skills that are probably best for, I would say, third grade and up, or maybe even second grade and up, depends on their computer skills. So I would consult your TVI before you put a child on the computer with the website, okay? Uh, because there are a lot of skills that they have to have. So we are on the high or low game, and I'm going to full Just screen. Frame, start button. Okay, it tells me I can start. So I'm going to hit the space bar to start. High or low activity. So I'm going to use my arrow keys. High, high or low, vert heading level three, current question, colon one. It said current question is number one. Heading level three, correct answers, colon zero slash 10. Oh, I didn't get any answers right yet. I wonder why. High button. So here are my choices. High. Play sound again button. Play sound again. Low button. Or low. As you can hear, the buttons are very clearly labeled. Here's something that's not very clearly labeled. Appears to say colon music play online graphic. That was something Google did. It says appears to say music play graphic. It appears to say that. I don't really know that, but that's what it appears to say. That's what Google says to us. So the whoever the website developer is has to take the time to put those labels on those buttons. So load play sound again. I forgot what the sound play was. sound. And I'm going to say. High button. That is high. High or low activity heading level three. So, so it 
automatically started playing the next one and you heard that balloon blow sound, so I guess that means I got it right. Heading level Let's three, say, correct I button. Heading uh, level three, correct answers, colon one slash ten. Oh, yay, I got one right. Hi button. Hi. Play sound again button. Play that sound again. Low button. Low. Well, let's, I'm going to. Play sound again, but high button. Yes, incorrectly. Oh. So you heard that there was a different sound for the wrong answer. So that is my other clue that, hey, I got that wrong. All right. So that. Two frames. Would be kind of how that game would go. 13. High or low. Uh, Wrapping to wrap correct. correct. Okay, I'm going to go back. High or low vertical to our list. This is three virtual bar. So virtual Bart instruments. Heading level three virtual tool used colon. Bart instruments link. All right. Bart instruments vertical bar music now, play online. Know. Bart instruments vertical bar music play online. One frame, two regions, seven headings, and twenty three links. We all know that there's no substitute for Bard instrument. But this is a pretty good one. Um, I tell you this, I use this in my teaching as a visual. And it's working the opposite way, I guess you can say, because I am showing the children what to do as by using it as a visual. And it is great for me because... Wrapping to top, virtual art, choose a tone set heading level I two. They can see it. So C I'm major going button. to put us... That was C major. C pentatonic button. And C pentatonic. Frame. C pentatonic button. And. Tap the bars to play heading level two. Tap the bars to play. And I'm going to tap key. Uh, by the way, I do not use the mouse. I cannot use the mouse at all. Just know that. C button. All right. So C, it told me that that was. And I can use the wonderful number pad. I have to turn something off on my screen reader. Off. And I can use the number pad at the top of our screen to play the bars, one through top of, not my screen, but uh, my keyboard. And now it's going to say, it's going to say something because it, I'm at the delete key right now, but we're just going to ignore that. C. Yeah, but it, there's the bar, but there's the bar. So this is good for any child, um, sighted or not to use those number keys. So great accessibility. I can play two of them. Our typical pattern. Okay. Um, I can I can do that. All right. So that is the Bard instrument. This is a rhythm interactive webinar demo vertical link bow wow wow. And so I have to go to the song. Bow wow wow vertical bar music play online. Bow wow wow vertical bar music play online. And I'm going to, I know that I need a to go so projectable interactives heading to interactives. I hit the H uh, for headings. Link soul flat challenge. Link note name challenge. I'm hitting my arrow. Link tone ladder. I'm hitting my arrow keys. Link beat and rhythm. Did I finish that sentence about heading? What I was saying was I have to hit H for heading because the website is constructed in such a way that I can quickly get to a particular section by hitting the letter H instead of listening to every single thing on that page because there's a lot there. Link, link, beat, and rhythm. So beat and rhythm is Open where full we want to go. Just we're going to full screen. Open full screen. Open the wow wow vertical. And then. Beat and rhythm activity heading level two. I have my menu. List of five items. One, point to the beat button. That's probably not going to work so well. Pointing to the beat. Two, beat. That was a joke. Three, clap the rhythm button. Four, beat and rhythm switch button. Yes. Five, beat or rhythm button. List end. List of four. Six, is it one sound or two left paren icons right paren button? Okay, I'm going to sh say eight, create a word rhythm pattern button. I'm going to show you this. Frame, frame, bow wow wow point. Create a word rhythm. Undo button. And so now it takes me to... Uh, the boxes. Unlabeled two button unavailable. Okay, so it said unlabeled two button unavailable. So that means there's something there that's not, I don't know what it is exactly, but I can't do anything to it. It. I mean, I know now that that is an empty box. Tommy button. So my two choices that I can put in the box are Tommy. Dog button. Dog. Instructions button. And now it's telling me the instructions. Let's see. To do colon, click on the word rhythms to create a word rhythm. Use it as an intro slash ending, as an ostinato, or as a B section while you sing the song. 
Okay. So I would like to install Tommy on label Tommy. I would like button. to put Tommy in the first dog. In the first dog. In the first box. Tommy button. Okay. And there it told me. I would like to put dog button. Dog in the second dog box. Dog button. And another dog. It didn't tell me, but um that's in the works. Tommy button. And then Tommy. Tommy so button. So then I'm not gonna well, I'll just go ahead and fill them all in. But unlabeled seven. So I know I have of one it. more box I haven't filled in. It tells me unlabeled. Tommy bu- dog button. Okay, and then I can Tom, go all the way music play Tommy button to the top. Dog button. Here's my first box. Dog button. Here's my second box. Tommy button. Third. Tommy button. Fourth. Dog button. Dog button. Dog button. Tommy button. Dog button. Instruction. Well, I think I skipped a box, but anyway, you get the idea that it's reading those boxes. And telling me what it is. I want to go to the next oh, well, well. activity. Choose body percussion or unpick on label two button here, unavailable. Here are boxes again. Um, 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 a rest button. But now. Quarter button. Quarter. That's a choice I have. Now that's visually showing you a quarter note, but it's audibly telling me a quarter note. And that is some magic accessible accessibility thing that they have done at Music Play. I don't, I don't really still understand what it is, but it's different from what's called alt text. Um, but it's something that's across the site. Anytime that there are things with notation, uh, when it comes to choosing links and such, like under rhythm practice or um, any of those sections, then it's, it's a, it will say quarter. Eighth, eighth button. There's eighth, eighth. Rest button. And rest. Eighth, quarter button. And once again. Quarter button. I can. Eighth, eighth button. Eighth, eighth button. Quarter button. Fill it quarter in. button. Eighth, eighth button. Okay. Quarter, and bu- quarter button. Quarter button. Go back up and choose button. Check my quarter button. Answer quarter. Quarter button. Eighth, eighth button. Eighth, quarter, quarter button. Quarter button. Eighth, eighth button. Rest button. Instructions button. Okay. So there, I can I can kind of check my my boxes and see what I have done. Um, that is fabulous. Um, I think that was the last one. I don't want to share my sound anymore. This is my normal speed of talk. Slide 20 heading level one accessibility in action. Okay, we saw this. Speech on demand. Make her be quiet. Um, so we're going to end with some resources. All these are linked in the handout. Um, so there are music notes there. Uh, these are the ones I have in my classroom, the smaller ones. And then there are some called mag notes. Um, there are bigger, bigger uh, size of magnets. I tried to contact the company and I was not able to do so. I, I have included their their information there, but note logic, but I was not able to contact the company, but they do have them music in motion, I think, or one of those places. I think I've seen them in music in motion too. Yeah. And sometimes places will say magnet, music note magnets, but they won't always be in the shape of the note. So be really careful about that. Um, here are some Braille music resources. Um, that first one is a uh, is like a wheel that is used to that is shows us the print equivalent, I think, and the Braille. I'm not really familiar with it, but I did hear it off of some something when I was looking through uh, doing some research. Um, Feel the beat. That was the thing I listened to about Braille music. And then Dancing Dots is a company that trans- has a software for tr- music transcription. Then we have uh, a few resources here that I found. Uh, this is the one by NAFME. Uh, it was it was really good. I'd never ran into it before, but it was a very well done presentation where I got several resources that I've included here. Uh, I have not used MuseScore. I know some people do, but I have I have not used it. This accessible ukulele chords uh, basically is a website which tells about how to what fingers to put your uh, you know what frets to put your fingers on, but it's done in a very accessible way. You can check that out. It's it's really good. I used it when I started learning last year how to play. The Music Education Network. It's a place that uh, where it has just uh, other people all across the country and Canada too, I believe, that are students, teachers, anyone that needs, it has TVIs on it, it has music teachers, it has artists, anybody, uh, and you can get their contact information. They have a roster that, that does that. So that's what I have for you.
That is wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I do have a couple questions. We have somebody, um, they have a blind student in their third grade class, Mm -hmm. and they're just about to start um, reading the music on the staff, and they start with BAG. Would it be better for her to teach the student by rote? Um, Should I provide Braille letters for her to read in the way she's familiar, or should, like, be introducing Braille music at all? What would you? Um, I I would say Braille Braille letters and rote rote teaching is good. If you want them, if you want her to get an idea of the staff, there's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, by using, you know, you can use that magnetic staff. Uh, I just wouldn't go into Braille music a lot yet, just because the whole concept of BAG uh, and trans and taking that to the recorder and then what is B exactly. Um, you know, that's going to be a new concept in itself, you know, remembering what the lines are. Yeah, we do the little mnemonic and everything, but even today, I still have to think about every good boy. OB is the third line, you know, um, just that process time takes a little bit. So I would kind of enter, you know, introduce all of that at once. That would be my suggestion or, you know, uh, uh, and once again, it depends on the student. If you think that, if you know that they're an excellent reader, then maybe maybe introducing just BAG and what it looks like on the music staff after you've talked about the letters, that would be okay. I have another question for, um, are there any music lesson braille books to use with students that you've used? Or- yes, um, there, there's a couple in the resources I've put. Um, yeah, there's... Oh, that feel the beat one. Uh, I, I think I said the wrong thing about it was it was a webinar I heard. No, the, the feel the beat, a curriculum for teaching Braille music that is on the resource page. Uh, that is that may be a place to start. I have not experienced that one, but uh, I did hear good things about it. So it is from the American Printing House for the Blind, which is a well-known um, place. And there are other materials out there, too. Um, and then I think this is going to be our last question, but people are curious to know what screen reader you're using right now. JAWS. I was using JAWS. JAWS. Okay. JAWS for Windows. I would say that if you were using a screen reader, um, I mean, if you were doing one of those rhythm activities, you might want to turn on narrator. And you remember where I was using the, the boxes and I was putting the, the words in there or the music notes it would probably speak what that is. So the child in the class, in the class, if you're doing it whole group, could hear that being spoken. So like, for example, I will have a child click on a note and I will hear it say quarter notes. And then I know that the child put quarter note on, clicked on the quarter note. That's because that's built in there, you know. Perfect. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, your email is available in your handout. Yes, it is in the handout. Feel free to email me. Um, I'm very open person, and if I, I will, I will get back to you. I don't mind talking to people, so I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help however we I can, because I know that there's not much out there, and I feel like I'm on both sides of the, of the coin. You know, being a music teacher and experiencing blindness myself. So it's, it's a, you know, unique situation. So I'm happy to help other music teachers to help their students to be successful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and thank you everybody for being here. Um, The recording is available on YouTube and on our music play workshop site. And that is also where you'll find the quiz and the handout. So thank you so much, Sonia. And see you all next week. (laughs) Thank you for sharing your time with us today. If you would like to earn a PD certificate for this episode, download the accompanying handout or watch the webinar, please go to workshops.musicplay.ca. See you next time. It's time for Music Play.